right? My AP literature friends. So Christian Kuhn coming at you again for another writing workshop, also known as the Bob Ross of Composition. And that's what I'm going to do in this video workshop is Bob Ross, how to tackle FRQ1 from the 2023 exam. We are into set two and we'll look at William Ellery Channing's poem, The Baron Moors. So what I'll do, if you're familiar with my work, is keep the status quo. We'll start by breaking down the prompt, and then I'll show you how to cobble together the introductory paragraph with my inverted thesis template. And then we'll jump right into the body paragraphs and construct those with my syllogistic method template. And then as always, I have a couple of conclusion paragraphs at the end featuring some of my sentence stems. So without further ado, how about we take a look at this prompt? So it states in William Ellery Channing's poem, The Baron Moors, published in 1843, the speaker addresses moors, which are open expanses of wild, uncultivated land. Read the poem carefully, then in a well-written essay, analyze how Channing uses literary elements and techniques to develop a complex portrayal of the speaker's experience of the natural setting. And in my classroom throughout the academic year, we do a number of poems that uh, are similar to this in which a natural landscape is, you know, either revered or deified. And I uh, do a whole unit on this. So this was right in a comfortable wheelhouse for my students. I think when they saw the year 1843, they paused a little bit and said, oh, shoot, we're going to get some old you know, some old school antiquated language in this, but it was pretty accessible and there's plenty to talk about in it uh, if students are versed in poetics to a tad bit. So immediately we got to ask ourselves this question. We've read the poem, we've ascertained the meaning of the poem, we get the intent, we get the construction of meaning. So student is at the exam site looking at a blank screen on the computer or a blank sheet of paper. How do I write the introductory paragraph? Well, my students intuitively know, kind of habitually, because I, I, I skill and drill it all year long, that they need to invert the thesis. But before we look at that template, let me qualify what you're going to see. So I'm that guy that's always peddling the question, the essential question. What if we taught composition like Bob Ross teaches painting? And here's what I mean by that. There's a fundamental difference between the assigning of writing and the direct explicit teaching of it. So I kind of embrace my inner Bob Ross and position myself as the expert writer in the classroom. I always encourage the teachers that I work with at the National Writing Project, or if I'm doing my own consulting, embrace yourself as the expert. Get to the proverbial easel and canvas and, and paint with your students. So use templates just like Bob Ross did. He used something called the wet on wet technique every time he did a natural landscape. And my students know they can either declare or invert the thesis. All body paragraphs, regardless of the expository mode, can be approached with the syllogistic method. So let's us jump right in here and, and talk about what's implicit in that prompt. And I contend that every single FRQ1 and FRQ2 dating back to the 1970s, implicit in the language of that prompt are two questions. The first is, what is the authorial intent? And the second is, how does the author construct meaning? And when students read, they need to answer both of those questions, right? What is the authorial intent? And how does the author construct meaning? If they do those two things and articulate it in the introductory paragraph, they are going to guarantee themselves the thesis point. So what my students do is this. They invert the thesis. And let's take a look at this graphically. They invert the thesis. So they're going to begin by answering the question, what is the authorial intent? And they're going to take three sentences to do that. My, my introductory paragraphs, no matter the expository mode, are always four sentences. So rhetorical analysis, argument, synthesis, persuasion, FRQ1, FRQ2, FRQ23 are all four sentences long. 
So they're going to end with the thesis. And when you end with the thesis, you're answering the question, how does the author construct meaning? The first three sentences are what, what, is, what is the author's intent? So you begin with context and background. And I always tell my students in, in FRQ1 and FRQ2, there's no need to start with a hook or an analogy. It's not the time to be cute. I don't think you need to uh, really wow your, lead, your, your reader with some poetic um, you know, exclamation. Just dive right into the analysis. So context and background with regard to the authorial intent. Some teachers refer to that as the universal truth, the universal theme, the exigence I've heard it referred to as. So just jump in right there. And then you end with the thesis by answering uh, how does the author construct meaning? And you're going to drop your terms, devices, techniques there. So there's other things that I like to put into the, the into the thesis, into the introductory paragraph. And one is tier two level vocabulary. What I mean by that is your average run-of-the-mill SAT level caliber word. I run an intensive word study academy with my students from day one because I know that there's a seismic vocabulary void uh, as I inherit kids each and every year. It becomes more noticeable. So I need to do all the tricks of the trade to get them to augment their vocabs. So you'll see my students in the samples here cop a nice academic tone without sounding goonish or contrived or pretentious. They stay in their wheelhouse, they stay in their lane, but they are their academic best. And then sentence constructs to break up that da dot da dot da dot da dot rhythm of loading independent clause and short simple short simple declarative sentences atop each other. My students have been versed in what Strunk and White call rule number 18. In their seminal text, they make the assertion that there's 12 different ways to cobble together a single sentence. So in order to achieve nice voice rhythm and flow, which is essential for the sophistication point, you'll see my students manipulate a wide array of syntactical features in these introductions. So just to recap, before we take a look at the first exemplar, three plus one equals the intro. Three sentences, authorial intent, one sentence construction of meaning in that order. So this is student number one here. They step to the plate and let's see how they manipulate this three plus one paradigm. So here it is, as paradoxical as it may sound, a man can only recognize unadulterated joy when he experiences the pure freedom of nature's solitude. And that's kind of the aha of the poem, right? That's the whole big picture. I like that said in that first sentence. Without the silence of solitude, unfettered freedom cannot be actualized. And in a likewise manner, it is only when man is truly cut off from all worldly thought and possession that he can experience a piece of heaven. So we're at the last sentence here. This is where I like to see the terms, devices, techniques. But I'm going to say this. Ending with just a thematic focus is a lit term, and then you save the lit terms, devices, techniques for the first premise, which we'll take a look at when we get to the body paragraphs. So you can end it as simply as this with like a thematic encapsulation. William Ellery Channing comes to such an understanding in his poem, The Baron Moors. Even though that does not dump a whole bunch of terms, devices, techniques, it is nonetheless a thematic thesis statement which is totally fine. You can do that. So as you can see here, the vocab is up. Sentence structures are nice and flowy. And uh, it does what it needs to to get the thesis point. And I think even out of the gate, it's in contention for the sophistication point. It's very well done. So let's do that again. Let's break it down. Three plus one. We'll see student number two. This student is perhaps my best writer that uh, I've ever taught. And uh, they crush this one. So look, look, how, look how they approach this. There's a fundamental difference between loneliness and solitude. And I, again, I think that's sort of the exigence of the poem. While on one hand, loneliness expresses the pain of being alone, solitude expresses the pure bliss and heavenliness of being alone. I like the philosophical differentiation there and the juxtaposition. The difference in this recognition is crucial to the understanding of one's individual freedom and ultimate happiness. So we're at the fourth sentence, terms, devices, techniques, construction of meaning. 
In the poem, The Baron Moors, Channing arrives at such a truth through the paradoxical interplay of nature's simple complexities. And I like that they, you know, use the term paradox and create a paradox for the thesis, nature's simple complexities, right? How can something be simple and complex at the same time? So I thought that was very artful and uh, definitely a sophisticated way to articulate the thesis. Again, tier two is present, sentence constructs flow. One piece of advice I give my students in the introduction in particular is, you probably don't want to parallel your sentence structures. And I see students do this a lot in college board sample papers. And oftentimes it's independent clauses and short, simple declarative sentences. And I already alluded to this. That's where you yield that choppy flow. It's chop, 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 chop is how it reads. And I tell students, pay attention to your sentences and don't parallel unless, unless you absolutely have a reason to do so, and then you know take your artistic license and uh, have at it, but have purpose, have intent, and know what you're doing. Yes, you can. You can do this. Your students can do this. Teachers and students definitely can do this. So let's have student number three come forward and show us their introduction. Again, same thing, three plus one. Classic inverted thesis. In order to hear the divinity of one's natural voice, one must be engulfed with an ineffable silence. Away from the hustle and bustle of man's contrived world, nature can provide such a respite. To hear this voice, pure silence is needed, a silence that only natural landscapes can provide. All right, we're three in, so construction of meaning sentence comes next. Channing, rather paradoxically, through a series of similes and syntactical manipulations, arrives at such a truth in his poem, The Baron Moors. I really like the vocab in here, words like engulf, ineffable. I even like hustle and bustle, contrived, respite. So the vocab's up without overdoing it. The lit terms are expressed in that last sentence. So you got paradox, uh, syntax, and similes. Again, you don't want it to be a dump. And I like the sentence flow. That third sentence with the use of the dash is very cool. I think that's a good flair. And then the stop stutter approach in the uh, fourth sentence is very nice too in terms of achieving voice rhythm and flow. So that's what my students do uh, in their introductory paragraphs. And I know some teachers insist that students only write one sentence for the exam. And I, I don't know, man, as a, as a college professor, if a student were to write one sentence introductions for me, I'd be like, eh, that's not very sophisticated. And the college boards used to say that come exam time, they want students to read, write, think, and speak like college sophomore English majors. I want my students to approximate that. So a four sentence bagger is really nice for the introduction. I think it puts, all of these kids are in contention for the sophistication point if they can sustain this in the rest of the paper. So I would have them do this and practice it as early as possible in the academic year so that it becomes habitual, kind of instinctual. They intuitively know what to do come exam time so that four sentences doesn't seem like such a monumental task. All right, at this stage of the video, I would pause it here. If you're doing this as a writing workshop in your class, have students write a few introductions, share them, uh, project them on your screen, break it down, talk about the good, bad, ugly. Teacher, I encourage you to Bob Ross a few yourself and uh, show your students how you do it just to get a sense of how to demystify things. All right, our next question is this. How do I write the body paragraphs? And for those that are familiar with my work, you know that I always say this, proceed syllogistically. The syllogistic method, your friend, it's the only template you need for all essays, whether you're taking the AP Lang exam, AP Lit, and this is how I teach at the college level as well. So um, my, uh, my college students do this. So let's break down what the syllogistic method is. I'll do a quick furtive drive through through it. If you wanna take a deeper dive, just go into my YouTube channel and there are lessons there how I teach inductive and deductive reasoning and uh, sort of my historical overviews of the syllogistic method. But for now, I'll give you a working knowledge. It's rooted in the Aristotelian tradition 
Aristotle ran a school called the Lyceum, and the town boys would go there to learn about polemics, oration, debate, wordsmithing, word wrangling, and they'd often throw out these juicy essential questions, just like we do. And one such question, which is featured in Plato's Republic, a seminal text, is what is justice? And the scholars and the philosophers would step to the proverbial mic and they would drop their definition of what justice is. And Aristotle, like us composition instructors, said, geez, why is it that some of my really bright students are fantastic in laying down their arguments? They're very cogent. Some students are just kind of meh at it, and other kids just tank bomb. They're all over the place. You know, did God come around on his gravy train and say, you will be endowed with the gift of the gab and you not so much? And he said, no, no, no. I have to find a way to get all of my students to think cogently. And we as well as composition teachers are tasked with the same battle. And one day he had a eureka moment and he said, I got it. My really good orators think syllogistically. They have a mathematical computative approach to their line of reasoning. And to give you an example, imagine an instance in which I said to you, first premise, arsenic is deadly. You all would say, Christian, you're 100% correct. And then if I follow it up with a second premise and state, my dog ate arsenic, you would say naturally in your conclusion, uh-oh, Christian, that's not going to bode well for your dog. Your dog is going to die. And Aristotle would call that a cogent argument. We in composition call it bulletproof line of reasoning. And how do we take that template, that heuristic, and turn it into a template for the purposes of performing literary analysis? Here it is. The first premise, we have to keep in mind, we are engaging in expository writing, so we have to argue. So it's going to be an argument containing terms, devices, techniques. This move is three sentences long, and I'll show you this in just a second. I got a model for you to show how to write the first premise. On FRQ1, the synthesis paper on AP language, the directions state three times, your argument must be central. And I carp on my kids about this all year long. Your argument must be central. As soon as you begin to paraphrase and quote way up high in the body paragraph, you switch the expository mode from literary analysis to plot analysis. So it's essential, crucial that students lay down their argument, their centralized argument. And I think three sentences is a nice space to do that. So three sentences for the first premise. Second premise is going to be textual support. And I like to see a teeter-totter balance between the quoting and the paraphrasing. Don't do one far more at the expense of the other. And then the conclusion of the body paragraph. We have to remember that body paragraphs need to be concluded because we know all too well. Students run like hell sometimes from their body paragraphs. And it's like, whoa, 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 get back here. Wrap this up for me. You ditched the effort. So they got to wrap that up by linking, echoing back to the first premise, the thesis, and the prompt. So the question is, how do you write the first premise? Let's take a look at one right now and get a sense of how to do it. So for those that are teaching this at home, I want you to steal my stems. My students often for FRQ1 and FRQ2 for the AP Lit exam, steal my first clause here, my first four words, right from the onset. So right from the onset, steal that if you want to. It's one of my sentence stems. Right from the onset and even take the comma along with it. I like this beginning because it cues the reader into knowing that you have a chronology, you have a sequence, that you're going to be methodical, that you're organized. And students often ask, where do I begin? And I always say, begin where the author begins and just methodically work through it and cross analyze when necessary. So what you do is cherry pick your terms. Look for the terms, the devices, the techniques that construct the meaning of the piece and go from top to bottom, top, middle, bottom. All right. So in one paragraph, you know, you probably want to take two or three things, uh, devices, techniques, terms and combine them together. That way you avoid 
you know, the real dutiful paper that never is going to get the sophistication point that does one paragraph tone, one paragraph diction, one paragraph syntax, right? We don't want to do that on the exam. So see how the pieces correlate with one another. So let's see what these three sentences do that comprise the first premise. Right from the onset, Channing creates a sense of the blissful inf infinitude this natural setting fosters for the narrator through his syntactical manipulations. So you got setting and syntax. In drawing a comparison between loneliness and solitude, so this is the theme, it's the juxtaposition as well, the author gives voice to the strange paradoxical overlap of the two. So you got paradox in there as well. To highlight the intense impact the setting has on the speaker, Channing also employs a number of nature-based similes to further convey his central theme. All right, that's loaded. You got a bunch of terms, devices, techniques in there that you got to unpack. And I always tell my students that, you know, the first premise is a promise, and we just promise the reader there that we're going to be talking about, you know, the setting. We're going to be talking about the syntax. We got similes in there. We got paradox. It's loaded. We got a lot going on. So just to recapture this, the first premise is three sentences and you got to argue. All right. You have to make sure you argue. So no quotes, no paraphrases in those first three sentences. All right. What I normally do here when I write, when I Bob Ross, is I pause after my first premise and I say, huh, I got to go lit term, or yeah, lit term hunting, lit term device, quote, hunting. So I pause and I look at the promise of my first premise and go get all the quotes and all the paraphrases that I need uh, in my second premise. Because you got to keep the promise of the first premise. And that's another way of talking about line of reasoning. Keep the promise of the first premise. If you do that, you're going to stay super cogent throughout the rest of your body paragraph and make sure that your line of reasoning stays perfectly intact. So if we keep the promise of the first premise, let's begin the second uh, premise. And again, this is all one paragraph. We're shooting for like 10 to 12 sentences because that's what a syllogistic paragraph is, 10 to 12 sentences. Those little itty bitty four or five sentence baggers aren't going to work. There's just not enough support or analysis in there um, to really flesh out any argument. So I have another stem and it's just one word immediately. Usually my students will take a, that word and begin their second premise. And then they begin to quote in the fourth sentence because that's the transition into the second premise. So immediately ties back to right from the onset. And again, it's just so that you can, you have your line of reasoning intact. So immediately, in order to convey the endless beauty and wonder of the Moors, as well as its heavenly presence, Channing takes several syntactical liberties, right? So it's hard to quote syntax. So I'm just going to paraphrase this. The odd use of the dash, which is preceded by a comma, placed, places added emphasis on the fact that on your bare rocks, he loves to lie, right? So get quoting in like fourth, fifth sentence. So we promised a discussion of syntax, and that's what you're getting right here. Even the repetition of on your bare rocks helps to suggest that the speaker visits these moors often when he wants those dim uncertainties that plague him in the world of man, which busy life delights to feel. So let's talk about these quote transitions because these are pretty unique and interesting. I do something called the five word rule. If a student places a minimum of five words in front of the quote and keeps the quote small, it should sound conversational and that's quoting, that's embedding at its peak, right? When it sounds conversational and you could just do wordplay with your quotes in the second premise. So this is going very well here. So we're still in the midst of syntax. We quoted, we got to analyze. The run on nature of the opening stanza corresponds to the timeless purity of this singular moment. But as the speaker notes, in, in a world where loneliness is something typically not to be desired, this particular solitude can fairly sate the passage of his loneliness day. 
All right, very good. So we're really cooking in peanut oil here. So everything's staying nice and cogent. Everything's nice and clear, but it's a one, two, three punch, quote, paraphrase, analyze, right? So as paradoxical as this may sound, it is only when one escapes to such a setting that the agitating world can come. Only nature can provide such a sanctified reprieve. And the similes speak of this, right? We got to keep in mind, we promised a discussion of the similes. So we got the setting, we got the syntax. Now we move on to the similes. Channing suggests that the moors are like crags upon the shores or clouds upon a placid sky. Later on, he states that they are even like the des desert islands far at sea. So we got plenty of support, plenty of analysis going on here, but we got to conclude the thought, right? We just can't skip out here and end on a quote. We got to conclude this. So we have all the quotes and or paraphrases for every single term device technique we mentioned in the first premise. So we're staying cogent, line of reasoning is all crispy. So let's end this. And usually the conclusion of the paragraph, and I really wanna be mindful in articulating this. The conclusion of the body paragraph takes about two sentences, sometimes three. So let's just wrap this up, go full circle. Nature coupled, coupled with solitude is the only thing that can yield such divine feelings. In a world wrought with bus business and busyness and human, human crowdedness, it is easy to think that happiness can be sought in these corridors. But as Channing reminds us, we are foolish for thinking so. In order to seek the silence most profound, one must totally cut themselves off from all the external noise. And again, syllogisms come full circle. You kind of end where you began, tie it back to the prompt, tie it back to the thesis. And again, you're shooting for 10 to 12 sentences for a syllogistic body paragraph. So that's why I have my students write four paragraphs. I'm often asked how many paragraphs my students write. All FRQs, Lang and Lit, four paragraphs. So let's ask ourselves the, this question. What do I do next, right? Because we have an intro and one body done. And the answer is simple, bust out another syllogism. So there's still a whole bunch of terms, devices, techniques that we have left to analyze. And we also have the middle portion of the poem, as well as that really poignant end line to analyze. So we're gonna do that in our second body paragraph, the third paragraph of the essay. So you're going to have, again, a three sentence first premise, change the literary focus, change the quotes, change the paraphrases, go 10 to 12 sentences, make sure you wrap it all up and go full circle on that syllogism. And voila, you have yourself a nice, you know, piece of analysis. And again, just to reiterate, four paragraphs, intro, two bodies and a conclusion. Speaking of that conclusion paragraph, let's wrap this essay up. So those that are familiar with my work, you know that for literary analysis and rhetorical analysis, I just like a big thematic crescendo at the end. Three to four sentences is all it takes. So I have sentence stems, and sometimes my students will say from a historical perspective or in a global sense, but another one that my students typically use is simply said comma. So look what this student did for this one here. And again, just three to four sentences for the conclusion. You don't need to go on and on and on. You gotta keep in mind, it's a timed essay and we've said everything that we need to say. Say, we're just putting a bow on it. Simply said, as odd as it may sound, in order to find peace and serenity, one must cut themselves off from everything and everyone. A good place to go to find such a reprieve is Mother Nature herself. There, in her silence, if one listens closely, they can find the essence of life. And that's how my students conclude their paragraphs. Big thematic firework display at the end. 
So speaking of end, we are at the end of our writing workshop for this particular FRQ. So happy teaching, happy writing. I wish you well. And just to wrap things up, let me give you some information on uh, how to contact me and, and how to, you know, kind of follow my... Uh, my social media presence. So I am a lead teacher with the National Writing Project, and we do professional development throughout the uh, calendar year. And this summer, we are hosting FRQ boot camps. So for Lang and Lit, we have two sections, one for Lang, one for Lit. If you really want to shore up how to teach the composition aspect of your course, whether it be Lang, Lit, or both, this is going to be a great PD. It's super affordable. I think NWP is the most affordable PD there is on the market. Um, so for a nominal fee, you can spend a number of hours with me and the folks at NBIT, NWP learning how to craft all FRQs on the uh, on, on, on that particular exam. And uh, it's pretty going to be a pretty cool uh, professional development opportunity. So if you want more information on that, you can go to uh, www.teachinghowtowrite.com. In the upper tab there, you'll see a link for my NWP courses. Just click on that and the drop down will show you the Lang and Lit sections. You can also feel free to reach out to me, teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com if you have any questions on that or any of the other PDs that we offer. So I know a lot of people are busy, so we do offer a self-paced course for those that uh, need that accommodation in their lives. And uh, we do the five-week Teach It Right Mastermind. Uh, we do alternative grading method courses. So the whole kit and caboodle. So hopefully you are well and uh, your students can crank a fantastic FRQ with my lead here. So that's it. Happy teaching, happy writing.